Greetings, welcome back to part two of the SCRV 104 here at Arsenal. Then. And starting off with, as I usually tend to do, the TC's hatch, this has been improved from that of the SCRV 101 102. The earlier Centurion hatch was a clamshell type, came down in two pieces, and we now have a single piece hatch here, which can also be placed in an open, protected, or an umbrella position. Lower down, though, the rest of the hatch is actually quite similar. It has lost a contra-rotating feature that was on the older version of the Centurion, which always kept the, uh, the cupola facing the same way, no matter what way the gun was going. I guess they decided it was too complicated or people's limbs kept getting caught off, whatever. So it's lost that, but the same general design of the cupola remains. So we still have the periscope binocular here, uh, the larger unity sight, which actually is a sight kind of, we'll come back to that, and the mounting point for an external machine gun. So that done, inside we go. TC seat of Centurion. Let's see if I can go down a little bit more here. I suspect yep, that will fold up and I can probably lower the seat somehow. This looks like a very suitable handle. And that's as low as it goes. I could do it going just a little bit lower, but okay, so be it as I almost take my eye out with the backup side. All right, so now I'm in. I guess I'll start at the top and work down. So the binocular periscope we've seen before on the Australian Centurion to my front is the large unity optic for seeing out. In front of that is telescope AFV number one, Mark one, which if you want to magnify, you simply bring up your monocular this way. Now I'm told by Stefan that this is also can be used as an auxiliary final sight for basically point-blank hip shooting. Although I can see why this would work, he says there's a little reticle that will, you can light up. Although I can see why this would work in traverse, I'm not quite sure how it works in elevation. Something I might have to come back to in subtitles, we'll see. Moving around, let's get this out of the way. Turret azimuth indicator, smoke grenade launchers, auxiliary firing system. So if the electrical system to fire the 105 doesn't work, there is a cable that you unhook, uh, unwrap, and you actually physically attach this to the breech fit mechanism, and this will provide enough electricity that when you lift up the emergency fire button and you push this, that the round will go off. Slew of periscopes all the way around. I mean, as far as vision goes, he's really not badly off at all. He does have to manually traverse the turret a little bit. I think it's still in the lock position. Let's try this. There we go. So it's a heavy, I mean, it is a heavy turret, no two ways around it. Uh, let's see if I can, yeah, there's a safety interlock here for lowering the hatch. All right, as we keep going around, illumination flare launchers. So left and right. The control system for the radios and intercom. It's generally speaking, if it looks vaguely familiar, you may have seen this on American vehicles. They simply changed a few of the um, a few of the larger words uh, to Swedish, but uh, channel select uh, as, uh, control. I mean, these are basically taken right off the American system. Now, something that they did change when they upgraded the gun control system uh, is the commander's handle, which el adjusts an elevation this way and spins for traverse. There is uh, a pound switch, so depressing the pound switch will disconnect the gunner's control. And behind this physical safety is the trigger. So you pull back, you can select either the cannon or the KSP, the coaxial machine gun, and as long as you're pressing down on the lever with your thumb, this allows you to bring your finger forward onto the trigger to engage it. So that's your safety interlock. 
Manual elevation for the TC. Mechanical. And actually, all it does is it's a chain that goes directly to the gunner's manual elevation control. Backrest behind them, you saw that the seat flipped upwards to uh, keep your chair nice and clean as you're getting in. Uh, to his rear is basically plenty of room for stowage. I see, his, I see a spare helmet. I see the water heater has been dismounted from its normal position by the loader. But they obviously did decide that they wanted to keep this early water heater. Now, of course, modern water heaters look a bit different. But when it's the middle of winter in a country like Sweden, I'm sure they don't care how old the water heater is, as long as the water heater heats water. Uh, otherwise, it's reasonably comfortable, I have to say. I mean, I could do with an extra inch or two of depression on the seat, but uh, my left leg is kept in place by a, a breech protector or a, uh, a gun protector, so it doesn't get caught against the breech guard as the gun elevates and depresses. Uh, my right leg is a little... I'm not quite sure what to do with it. It sort of digs a bit into the gunner's backrest. Left leg just sits here on the shell casing collector. But other than that, it's a, it's a centurion. I mean, it's an old position. There's only so much room inside it, but I can't complain too much. So that is the TC's position. Can't really complain at all. So let's move forward and see what the new toys are that the Swedish government has given a centurion gunner here. The gunner seat is tolerable. I'm not going to say there's any room for them to move around, but neither are they compressed and confined in, a, in an uncomfortable position. So as long as I'm not in here for more than half an hour to an hour, I'm okay. Otherwise, you want to be a lot shorter. The gunner is equipped with basically the only thing that approximates a turret basket in this particular tank. They've removed it in order to make room for more ammunition. You will see that there's a lot more dials, knobs, buttons, and switches than you would expect in a typical Centurion. And this is courtesy, at least this side, of Before's Armaments. And they have put in a proper fire control computer. So if you look at the various settings, as I get out of the way here a little bit, and you enter in all the various different data. So air temperature, uh, there's wind speed, wind direction. Uh, you can select exactly which version of uh, ammunition you are firing. So is it uh, Sabo, is it AP? Your main selector at the bottom right is for the fire control system uh, for the computer. So HE rounds, or you could also fire smoke with the HE selected. Uh, AP, depending on which version of AP you have. And KSP will give you the ballistic solution for the machine gun. Uh, it doesn't select what happens when you pull the trigger, that's another matter. Uh, drift correction. Uh, now, I'm told that the wind direction, th they didn't bother with wind speed, wind direction, they simply uh, adjust it off. The control to the right is the uh, defroster for the, uh, for the sight. The sight is made by Ericsson, it's to my direct front here. I'll get out of the way and give you an inset in a moment. Controls for the Traverse system, manual hand, and he didn't tell me what Fran was. I'm going to guess brake. There is also the manual drive down underneath. Now, the site, as I say, is done by Ericsson, not before us. And what they have done with this one is they've integrated a laser rangefinder, the control for which is further forward on the left. The gunner's control handle has similarly been modified together with that of the commander's sight. So on the handle itself is the magnification. So by one on the right or by eight on the left, uh, which actually contradicts a little bit of what I read in Jane's about the sight being a by 10. Uh, on the right is if your target is stationary or if it's moving. And you'll see a similar setup in leopard tanks, dynamic lead or stationary target. PAM switches are further forward. 
The left trigger will control your coaxial machine gun, your right trigger will control the main cannon. Moving on the left hand side, you can see what Ericsson also have done. So you got a gyro stabilizer, there is the controls for the laser rangefinder. Now it is integrated, so as you were traversing, if you have the dynamic lead selected, you then laze to the target and it will uh, apply lead and super elevation accordingly. Further to the left, we have the turret clock or azimuth indicator for firing on set directions at night. It is possible to do indirect still with this between the combination of the azimuth indicator and the elevation quadrant. Manual control for the elevation of the 105 millimeter cannon with a secondary trigger on the left here. There is also a possibility of firing the machine gun manually by use of the foot pedal. So it's not a main gun foot pedal, it's just the, uh, the machine gun. Down underneath, this brass handle is an emergency power club. So ordinarily the traverse motors, it's an electric traverse system, are fairly high voltage. Uh, but in case the power system goes down, say the engine is knocked out, it is possible to run on the vehicle's battery. So you pull this, you're down to a 24 volt system. The turret will not traverse as fast as it would if you had more than 24 volts, but it's still easier than the hand cranking everything. So use the electric power to do a major turn and then use the manual controls to do the final lay. And then as I said, if you have no power to the gun directly, use the auxiliary power supply on the turret side. So that is basically what you can do to a Centurion to bring it up to vaguely modern specifications. It's still not great for night fighting. There's no light intensifier or anything like that. You're up purely to what the Lyran uh, flares will illuminate. Each flare will last about 30 seconds and they'll have a designated set of flare tanks whilst everybody else does the shooting. Outside of that, uh, it's an upgraded Centurion. It is a 1940s tank that has been upgraded to be reasonably capable by 1990 standards. So it's not the most dangerous thing on a battlefield, but it is plenty good enough against anything short of a first rate MBT of the time. Right, last section, the loader. Right, loader side. Well, the problem that he has is that they've removed a the turret basket in this tank in order to increase ammunition supply. So he's got to make sure that he doesn't get his legs chopped off. So what he will do is sit on the lip of the turret. His feet are going to go st either on the shell catcher or perhaps the little tray for extra ammunition and he will grab around and sling them in this way. Now the problem that he has is he only has four rounds. Case of two, case of two, and then underneath the gun, laying horizontally, are an additional four that he can access reasonably quickly. Once you have fired those eight rounds, or realistically, because you probably have them split between HE and AP, um, there's not much more you can do. Uh, you have to stop the turret from traversing in order to access the remainder of the ammunition, which is under the turret floor. So in order to do that, he's got a safety interlock right here, flips it to off, and the turret drives off. So he may now get down, open up the bins, access the extra ammunition. Once he has restowed his eight rounds, set it back to go and away you go. So obviously this means that there is only a limited sustainability in firepower for this tank. So you fire your four rounds, presuming, and that's it. And it doesn't take you very long to fire four rounds. Breach, it's the same 105. It's horizontally sliding which uh, with easy access. The handle is further down low. To the front, you're going to see a couple of different things. Firstly, directly over the gun, there's a selector between a subcaliber uh, gun or the main gun. So if you're in training, you want to fire the subcaliber, flip the subcaliber, and the electrical signal will go outside, mounted onto the gun tube. Coming to the left is one of the NATO type dome lights, there's one directly behind them as well. And then the mounting point for the coaxial machine gun. Uh, this is now a 7.62 millimeter, but it is basically a reboring of the older Swedish machine gun, which is basically a 1919. Periscope to the front is his way of looking out. And 
although it will adjust in elevation, I can't get it to traverse. It may just be stuck. Stowage for coaxial machine gun ammo. Coming around, J-Box pistol port, the split two-piece hatch, and in the bustle on his side is the radio set, which as you can see is an American one. Although the control box on the left at least has been changed to the Swedish language. Now if you come down, you're going to see that in the firewall there's a little access port so you can uh, get some of the components back there. And well that is basically it for the interior of the turret. So now all I have to do is figure out how to get into the driver's hole. So when you get into the crew compartment for this particular Centurion, the first thing you'll notice is that there's no god-awful central stick shift in between your legs. Because we have a new transmission, it also means that you're short a pedal. There is now an absolutely massive brake pedal that you can use both feet if you really have to stop quickly. And an equally, you're, you're not going to fall off it, uh, accelerator pedal is on the right. Steering is done by use of this tiller system. And to the right, well, you have your automatic transmission selector. So positions are neutral or park. Uh, you depress the parking brake and over it goes. Uh, come down to low range, up to 14 kilometers an hour, it says. Flip over to high, and that is your high range gearbox. Then if you want to go into reverse, you lift up the lockout into reverse, and that is all there is to this vehicle. It really is a very simple vehicle to drive. And according to the director, they loved it. Uh, it was also apparently the way it kept the track under correct tension as it was driving around. It also meant that apparently these vehicles with the automatic transmission had a reputation for throwing track a lot less frequently than the manual transmission Centurions. As you go around to the right, speedometer set for either miles an hour or kilometers an hour. Another turret position indicator. And then you start coming to your dash. So it's your usual array of oil pressure, oil temperature, uh, engine temperature, and so on and so forth. Just underneath the gauges here is your front tank selector. So ordinarily you run on the rear tanks, but if you need to, use this one off the front. Moving further back to the main control panel, and I'm going to guess that start is the start button and stop. Uh, I'm going to guess is stop to basically it's a diesel cutoff. And then you go a little bit further to the back. Uh, vocal string is your smoke generator, which is now being fitted. Then you come down to the light control, and I just keep coming across this light control in all sorts of vehicles all over. If, if it's the Western vehicle, it seems to be a 50 50 chance you're going to come across this light control. And uh, I've gone over it before. Come a little bit further down, we have the uh, cover for the slave start receptacle. There's a bunch of circuit breakers further to the rear. Coming around the left hand side, rev counter, you can see there's a uh, pressure reader here for the brake pressure. Your typical dome light with white light or red. And on the far side of the wall, of course, here is going to be the front diesel fuel tank, and the batteries are behind it in between the diesel and the crew compartment.
plenty of ways of losing your fingers with uh, closing this. I'm sure there's a way of doing it normally. Now, if you're going to look outside with your periscopes, it looks like you kind of have to choose which of the two periscopes you're going to use to look out of. So that, I think, brings us to an end of the inside. So let's see if I can get out of here without breaking any of my fingers. You think the tank's on fire? That's why you got a fuel extinguisher, a fire extinguisher. Oh, oh, for fuck's sake, hang on. <laughs> this is supposed to be, this is supposed to be spring loaded, so we'll see what happens. I think they need to work on these springs. One. Oh, this one's much easier. Let's rotate the periscope out of the way. This will make it easier to get out. I can only imagine that when they were new, those things spun a lot more easily. So there you go, the STRV104, about as good an upgrade to Centurion as you are going to find. And indeed, the Swedes did not actually stop there. They built a couple more improved prototypes. For example, they replaced the Horseman bogey suspension units with a hydropneumatic type and new track. But with the Leopard 2 starting to come online, the capability we're going to get out of these old Centurions it just wasn't worth the upgrade, so they abandoned that idea. Uh, and indeed, less than 10 years after these 104 modifications were made, they started being withdrawn from service anyway, with the last unit, I think it was a reserve unit, losing theirs in about the year 2000. So there you go, that's the end of this video, and indeed this batch from Arsenal. And shout out yet again to the lads on Patreon, PayPal, Subscribes, or any other method that they are using to help fund these trips. I hope you are finding it a worthy investment. So till the next one, Take care. So looking at the manual, it seems that the, uh, no, never mind. So there you go, the, so there you go, the STRV 104, pretty much the ultimate Centurion upgrade. Yes, I know about South Africa, but yeah. So there you go, the Centurion, uh, so there you go, the STRV 104. With the numbers of Leopard 2s or STRV 121-122 coming on board. So there you go, the STRV 104. About as good an upgrade as you can put onto a Centurion. Now the Swedes did come up with even further upgrade options. For example, there was a new suspension system trialed with uh, hydro pneumatic suspension units to replace the horse. So there we go, the SCRV 104, about as good an upgrade as you're gonna get onto a Centurion. So that is it, the tour of the S104. Good Lord, three, two. Well, there you go, the STRV 104, about as good an upgrade to Centurion as you're gonna find. With the Leopard 2s starting to come online, the what the effort wasn't worth uh, god lord so there you have it the scrv 104 about as good an upgrade to centurion as you are going to find and the swiss actually did not stop there so there you go the strv 104 about as good an upgrade to centurion as you are going to find so hope that you find this a useful investment Worthy investment. So that is... Uh. So as ever, I hope you found the tour interesting and informative. And again, a shout out to the lads on Patreon, Subscribestar, PayPal, or any other way that they're helping out fund this trip and the videos that are coming out of it. I hope you found... Uh. So that's it. I hope you found the video interesting and informative. 
So that's it from Arsenal and on this run. I hope you found the videos interesting and informative. Thank <laughs>